Test two, hey, hey. Test one, two. Two, two. Yeah, that's probably plenty. Yeah. Thanks.
Alex for Visitor. Excited to have you here uh, in this space and we continue to talk about who you are uh, in Jesus. My name is Luke Comfort. I am um, a senior up at the Wisconsin Lutheran Seminary in Mequon and I'm just filling in uh, for Pastor Strong. He was away on vacation or something, I think, so he asked me to just kind of fill in for him as you guys continue to study who you are in God's Word. Let's start things off today uh, by bowing our heads and folding our hands. Dear Heavenly Father, in your word, you have a lot to say about who we are in you and who we are in your Son, Christ Jesus. Please bless our time today as we study who we are and how our talents help our other fellow believers and the world around us. Please be with us today and every day. In your name we pray. Amen. So last week, if you weren't here, we talked about who you are in Jesus. We, we talked about how we are we're loved. Um, we looked at how God loves us through the gifts that he gives us and through the blessings that he offers us in his son. Last week, it ties in very well with today because today we are talking about who do you think you are and we're going to focus on our talents, what it means to use and have the gifts and the abilities that God has given us. And we're really going to kind of come at this from two different ways. We're going to look at our talents as they relate to us, um, the fact that God created us as people who have talents and gifts that we use. And we're going to come at it also from the angle of we have gifts and talents and abilities and who we use those gifts and abilities and talents for. And to start things off, I want to have us take a look at a passage. Um, this is Peter writing in his first letter. Um, he writes to the Christians and he says, Each of you should use whatever gifts you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. Before I get to my first question for you, just a little bit of background knowledge uh, on what Peter is writing for and who Peter is writing to that might kind of help you put this in perspective. In this letter from Peter, he's really writing to Christians that are currently undergoing persecution. persecution. Um, by the Roman government, Christians that are being assaulted and killed and harmed um, by the government that they have over them. And throughout this whole letter, Paul is kind of weaving um, this story, this encouragement to these believers to stand up in the face of persecution. And so I think it's kind of interesting that Peter here is talking about and encouraging his uh, addressees, the Christians, to be using their gifts and abilities to serve others because if you're in a situation where you're under persecution, where somebody's really trying to harm and hurt you, a lot of the times your first gut reaction is not to think, how can I help other people? But the more human response of self-preservation, right? If somebody's trying to hurt you or harm you, you're thinking of yourself primarily. But here we have Peter, interestingly enough, encouraging his believers to be stewards of the gifts that they've been given and to help and serve other people, even in spite of the persecution that they've been going through. And I'd like to focus especially on this word up here as faithful stewards. And I'd like you to take a little time and talk among the person sitting next to you or the person at your table and reflect on what it means to be a steward of something. So take a minute or two and just discuss what that word uh, means to you when you hear Peter use it. What does it mean to be a steward of something?
everything's kind of dying down a little bit, let's kind of bring it back. Uh, and what, what, what was something you discussed among yourselves as you reflected on that word, uh, what it means to be a steward of something? What are some things you guys came up with? Mm-hmm. Yeah, so the idea of being responsible for something, that's something that I wrote down there too. Uh, stewardship is kind of a, um, what's the word I want to use for it? It's kind of a two-way street where you've been given the charge of something, but then it's kind of on you to make sure that um, whatever you were made to be the steward of uh, actually comes and follows through. If you're given like an account of money or something, or if you're put in charge of a group of people or maybe a machine or a business, um, you're the steward of it, you get to enjoy that thing, but it's also on you to make sure that it's used in the proper way and that it's used for what it was intended. So I think that's a, that's a very good um, word that we can attach under stewardship is the idea that if you're a steward, you are responsible for something. Anybody else have any other thoughts? Mm -hmm. Yeah, you're kind of the almost like a representative of what you're a steward of, right? If, if, if my boss um, says, I need you to go to the street corner and try and sell this thing or tell people this message, I'm representing um, the person who's made me a steward of that thing. So I think that's, that, that's a, good, a good word we can fit under stewardship as well, as you're representing the person who's made you a steward of that thing. Any other thoughts? I think those, those two actually cover pretty well what I had um, in response to this question. You're responsible for something. Maybe another um, side of that is just being in charge. Um, you have power over some type of person or ability. If I'm the manager at a restaurant or a store, I'm in charge of and I have the right and the authority to tell these people what to do and how to do their job. But like you mentioned, we're still responsible and I'm still re representing the people that, who, who have made me um, a steward of that thing. Just to go back to our passage, I think it's pretty obvious, but the type of stewardship we're talking about here and today is stewardship of gifts and talents, right? We're not talking about the stewardship of a business or the stewardship of maybe uh, a machine or something like that, but we're talking about the stewardship of the gifts and abilities that God has given us. There's a little, I hesitate to say it's a problem, but there are some issues that come up when we start to explore this a little bit, I think, because... It's a very common thing among people to not feel very talented, right? Or to feel like my talents are maybe not being applied correctly. There's all sorts of issues that come up when we start to talk about our talents. And my next question for you is why exactly does a person question whether they're talented or not? We had that passage from 1 Peter where he said, you have been made stewards of these different gifts. But that doesn't always convince us, right? We still sit and we question whether we're really talented or whether God has really given us those gifts. So talk among yourself again for just a couple minutes and discuss why a person might question whether or not they're talented. <laughs> is dying down a little bit again. So what, what did you guys come up with? Why do people question whether or not they're talented? Yeah. I think our biggest thing was that how easy is it to compare ourselves to others? It's like, oh, this person's a really good public speaker. I'm not. But then it's just like, well, what else are you good at? And we lose focus of, hey, I'm really good at this. You're really good at this. 
Yeah, that, that was one of the things I had written down is that just sinful human tendency to compare ourselves to other people, right? Um, I sometimes think this is, this is sort of heightened with technology where back in the old days, you know, you maybe had a smaller group of people. Now I can get on YouTube and see like six-year-olds that can play piano way better than I'll ever be able to. And it just kind of makes you really start to question, am I really talented? Do I really have gifts if all these other people are so much better at this thing than I am? So I think that's, that's definitely a very big part of why we question whether we're talented, is just comparing ourselves to other people. Uh, one thing I thought of was that maybe if someone feels they don't have a talent or something because they haven't even tried it. Okay, yeah, that's an interesting one. Yeah, you, you, you might not have even tried something that you don't realize you would be good at if you just kind of gave it a shot. And, that kind of, I think that kind of comes in, too, with the comparing yourself, where if I see somebody that's really good at something or really has a gift, I say to myself, why would I even bother trying this when somebody else is so much better at it than I am already, when you might actually be good at it in the end? Yeah. Yeah. I think it's um, kind of a, a common misunderstanding with the talents and gifts, where if I try something and I'm not immediately good at it, that means I'm not talented, instead of realizing it takes a lot of hard work to get to the place of saying you're talented at something. Mm -hmm. So putting in those hours versus just expecting to be, you know, have a natural aptitude for something. Yep. I think we sometimes see people that just seem to be naturals at certain things and we don't realize how many hours of silent, slow practice went into that thing and how many times a person had to trip and fall and fail before they finally got good enough. Because the only thing we see is maybe the performance or the YouTube video or the Facebook post or something like that. We don't see all the other hours and hours that went into something. So I think that's a very good one too is just we don't realize how much work sometimes it takes to be able to really use those gifts and abilities that God has given us. Yeah. One more thing, and I think that I heard Joan say this um, too. It's you look at the pastors, and they go through all this training and all this stuff and everything too. And you kind of, and almost like you're comparing yourself, like, well, I can't do kind of what they're doing in certain things just because I don't have all that training that they've gone through and everything too. Mm -hmm. So at that point, you just kind of say, well, you know, I kind of give up because it's, <laughs> it's too much. Yeah, you, you look at how much, maybe you look at how much work it does take to get, I think the, the rule I've sometimes heard is the 10,000 hour rule to become like an expert or really good at something and you say, I don't, there's no way I have 10,000 hours to put into something, so why would I even try from the get-go? So yeah, I think that, that's a good point as well. What I kind of, what I, what I had is I think there's kind of two angles you can come of why we question whether we're talented or not. One we kind of talked about is how we're, measuring our talents, and I think you guys did a pretty good job of talking about that. We're comparing ourselves to others a lot of the times. Sometimes we're even comparing ourselves to ourselves. Um, this is sometimes kind of the problem with self-help literature and things like that, is you're, you're kind of trying to reach a goal that is unattainable. Uh, nobody's perfect. Um, you could probably listen to some famous piano players and musicians, and if you would talk to them, you wouldn't even realize how many mistakes they make, because as much as we try to chase something like perfection or the perfect use of our gifts and abilities, we can just never really fully get there because of our sinful nature. The other thing I had that I think is an angle of this question as well is just how we're defining gifts and talents. Um, I think we live in a world that's very much winner take all when it comes to this kind of stuff. Um, when we think of talents, we sometimes think of being really good musicians or being really good public speakers or maybe having a real aptitude for business and making a lot of money. And sometimes we miss all of the other gifts and abilities and talents that the world really doesn't care about very much and the world doesn't give a lot of um, lip service to, but in God's eyes are really probably just as important as all these other talents. Um, I always like the analogy of uh, the football team where who's the most important person on the football team? Is it the running back and the quarterback and the, and the, and the wide receiver or is it the linemen, the guys that sometimes don't get um, as much credit and glory, but if a guy misses a block or if a guy doesn't hit the right guy he's supposed to, none of those other things um, are going to work correctly and that wide receiver isn't going to make that touchdown. And It's just the sinful tendency of the world to kind of give the glory all to one person at the expense and missing out on all of these other people that might have contributed to something. 
kind of like you guys were talking about all the, the hours of practice and how much a person maybe has to try. Um, you don't think of maybe the mom and dad who brought that kid to piano lessons when he was a kid even though he didn't want to and how much they had to sit there and listen to their son um, playing the drums really, really badly in the garage before he got really good at it. Uh, so there's other gifts and abilities and sometimes it's just we have a very narrow way of defining um, gifts and abilities. And so my encouragement is to just kind of expand your understanding of what gifts and talents are. Uh, it's more than just the stuff you see on television and YouTube. It's everything that we do with our lives. Here's another passage that I think kind of ties into and expands on a lot of this. This is uh, Ephesians 2 verse 10. Uh, and this is Paul writing to a group of believers who are kind of struggling with the same issue of what does it mean to have gifts and abilities and talents and to be um, people who are created by God. Paul writes and he says, For we are God's handiwork, created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. And for now, I'd just like you to focus on one part of this passage. I'd like you to focus on... Oh, make sure you don't block it out what it means to be God's handiwork. So just take a couple, uh, maybe a minute or two, and talk among yourselves. What does that word mean? What does it mean? And why does it matter when Paul writes and says that we are God's handiwork? Let's kind of circle things back up again. Why, let me get back to the question, why, why does it matter that we are God's handiwork? Well, the thing that hit me first was when someone is going to make a piece of handiwork or whatever, they have to plan, they have to plan what they're going, how they're going to do it, you know, why they're doing this and everything too. And I think when God creates us, the, the, the word that I wrote down, which I think is a good word, is creature. Um, we think of God as the creator, and we are his creatures. And sometimes we apply that term more to like animals, uh, like badgers and, I don't know, wolves or something like that. But I think it, it, it is helpful to keep in mind that we're God's creatures, too. We, we've been created by God, um, just like a woodworker uh, crafts a duck decoy or a clock or something like that. We're, we're, we're the same way, too. God has created and he's made us. Um, and you kind of tied into the last part of the passage there is that God has prepared, created us, and he's prepared things in advance for us to do. Um, people don't just create things for no reason at all. Most people create things for a purpose. Um, you write a song because you want people to appreciate the beauty of the music you're writing. You paint a picture because you have something you want to say. You go to work and you maybe make food or you are a cook for somebody because you want them to appreciate um, the thing that you've made for them and the thing that God has given them as well. So I think that that's very helpful to think about the fact that where God's handiwork means we've been created by God to do something. Anybody else have any other thoughts on this one? Yeah. Uh, I'm just sorry. Yeah, and that's that's a good point. That's going to be we're going to that's a good tie in actually what we're going to talk about is we're going to talk about how we're all created by God, but we're not all created equal, right? I think I see about 30 very very unique and distinct people 
uh, sitting in front of me right now. Guy didn't just create a bunch of clones. Uh, he created each of the, us uniquely um, because he wants us to be part of that body um, of believers that he set up. Anybody else have any other thoughts? Yeah. I put down the word like tapestry. The Lord makes mm -hmm. our lives a tapestry, and that comes with our with forgiveness that He gives us. Mm -hmm. So when we're broken or we mess up, He doesn't throw our, the handiwork away. He He lets us. He helps us reprint that and weave in another part of our life. Yeah, that's a very good tie-in. If you, I'm glad you brought that up because this is kind of a, a, what I wanted to bring up as well is. This middle part here, created in Christ Jesus, Paul really uses two different, um, what's the word, not themes, two different ways to talk about how we're created. We're created as God's handiwork. I kind of think of, you know, uh, Genesis 1, the fact that we've been physically created by God. He designed us and he made us. But then we also are part of that new creation as well, the fact that we've been created in Christ Jesus um, all of those sins we have of doubting our talents and doubting our abilities are washed over and covered over in Christ. Um, we have this new person that's living inside of us, this person that God sees instead of that sinful um, nature that we have inside of ourselves. And that is very much, too, a part of what it means to be God's handiwork. And just like you would mentioned earlier, being a part of God's body and God's temple all ties into this. Is this isn't what we are by nature. This is what we are because of what Jesus Christ has done through us, through his death on the cross and through his resurrection and through forgiving our sins. So, yeah, very good point. Anybody else have any final thoughts? Our fill in the blank on the bottom, kind of tying into what you'd mentioned before in the very end of this passage. We are created by God to do works he prepared for us to do. I think that kind of summarizes nicely what we've talked about so far. Um, God created our physical bodies. He also created a new spiritual person inside of us through Christ Jesus, not just to kind of put us on a display case, but because he had works that he wanted us to do. God created us for a purpose. I think this is a very helpful thing to think about, especially in our modern world, as a lot of people struggle with, I think, a lot of meaninglessness, um, how hard it is to just kind of go to the same job every single day, and sometimes it's hard to see the point um, of why you're waking up in the morning we can have confidence and we can have faith and we can have trust that no matter how uh, boring our lives are, might seem, how much we might think that our talents aren't being put to good use or that we don't even have any talents at all, we can look to God and what he says to us in his word and we can be reassured that God has created us uh, for a purpose and that God has a plan for our lives. Let's take a little break and we're going to sing our first song, Yet Not I But Christ in Me. Good morning, everybody. That's a little bit loud. Thanks, Pastor. Uh, my name is Zach. Uh, this is my first time back here at Grace in the Ward since the pandemic. So it's good to be back and worshiping with everybody here again. Um, this is a song called Yet Not I, but Through Christ in Me. And I'm not sure if this is one... Uh, you guys have done here before, so as always, uh, please just meditate on the words and the melody and join in whenever you feel uh, comfortable. This is just a song about, I thought it was quite fitting, talking about our talents and uh, even, the, even the category of the grace that we have um, over and over again. Uh, we give the credit back where the credit is due. gift of grace is Jesus my Redeemer. There is no more for heaven now to give. He is my joy, my righteousness and freedom. My steadfast love, my deep and boundless peace. To this I hold my hope is only Jesus, for my life is wholly bound to His. Oh, how strange and divine I can sing on this mighty yet not I, but through Christ in me. Then I 
night is dark, but I am not forsaken. For by my side, the Savior, He will stay. I labor on in weakness and rejoicing. For in my need, His power is displayed. To this I hold, my shepherd will defend me. Through the deepest valley, He will lead. Oh, the night has been won, and I shall overcome. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. I dread, I know I am forgiven. The future sure, the price it has been paid. For Jesus bled and suffered for my pardon. To overthrow the grave, to this I hold my sin. Jesus now and ever is my plea. Oh, the chains are released. I can sing, I am free, yet not I, but through Christ in me. With every breath, I long to follow Jesus, for He has said that He will bring me home. And day by day, I know He will renew me, until I stand with joy before the throne. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. Complete, still my lips shall repeat, yet not I, but through Christ in me. To this I hold, my hope is only Jesus. All the glory have more to Him. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat. Not I, but through Christ in me. When the race is complete, still my lips shall repeat. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ in me. Yet not I, but through Christ. So the first half of our Bible study for today, we focused on kind of our gifts and our talents as they relate to us as individuals, what it means to be created and crafted by God to do good works. Our second half today is kind of going to focus on how that now works and how we relate to other believers who also have gifts and talents. Um, you are probably very aware of the fact that it's easy to become jealous and envious of other people for those for their gifts. We kind of talked about that a little bit when we're talking about comparing ourselves to other people. Um, the Apostle Paul, in our selection from 1 Corinthians verse 12, was also dealing with this issue. Um, the entire book of 1 Corinthians is kind of written to this group of Christians who are really 
not getting along well at all. They had a lot of issues between themselves, a lot of things Paul was trying to help them with and help them figure out. And one of those things, like is common in pretty much every body of believers in every church, is how people who have been given gifts and talents and abilities get along with each other. So listen as I read this selection from 1 Corinthians 12. And the question we're going to focus on after this is, what comfort is there in knowing that the Holy Spirit works through us? So here's Paul writing to the church in Corinth. Now about the gifts of the Spirit, brothers and sisters, I do not want you to be uninformed. You know that when you were pagans, somehow or other, you were influenced and led astray to mute idols. Therefore, I want you to know that no one who is speaking by the Spirit of God says, Jesus be cursed, and no one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are different kinds of gifts, but the same Spirit distributes them. There are different kinds of service, but the same Lord. There are different kinds of working, but in all of them and in every one, it is the same God at work. This is the first half of what Paul has to write to the Corinthians. Um, Oh, wrong direction. One of the things Paul talked about, I'll, I'll go back to the passages, you can see them, but just knowing that the Holy Spirit is working through all of these different gifts and abilities. So I want you to take a second and just discuss them on yourselves. What comfort in, is there in knowing that the Holy Spirit is working through the gifts that he gives us? So just take a second and talk about that question among yourselves. down a little bit, so let's bring it back. What did you discuss? What comfort is there in knowing that it's the Holy Spirit who's working through our gifts and abilities? Yeah. It further instills that how all of our gifts have a purpose. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the idea that your gifts and abilities have a purpose, right? You know that ultimately you're the one who is being a good steward of these gifts, right? But it's not you who's really doing the work. It's the Holy Spirit working through that faith that he's created in our hearts. Yeah. Trusting our mindsets that um, we should just comfort that the Holy Spirit will bless our talents and gifts. Um, we may not be that great that person. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I think that's a really important point, and kind of we, we mentioned that before as well. The fact that you don't have to be the best at something um, for the Holy Spirit to work through you. Um, I'm a pretty mediocre musician, but I still like to go and play music for people in church. And I know that you know I don't have to be the best person um, to have the Holy Spirit work through me and to have people be blessed by those gifts. So I can have that assurance that even if I'm not the best, even if I'm not an expert, uh, even if I'm not getting a million Facebook views or a million YouTube views for what I'm doing, I know that the Holy Spirit is still working through that to expand God's church and work faith in people's hearts. Mm -hmm. Yeah, 
yeah, we still try our best. And I think you can have a certain amount of probably more faith and confidence that the average person does that something good is coming through what you're doing. Um, I think about a person that's not a Christian, not a believer, and how much harder that must be to use your gifts and your talents and your abilities when your measuring stick is kind of the world. Um, do people like what I'm doing? Do people not like what I'm doing? That, that, that's kind of how you're always measuring yourself. As believers, we really don't have to measure ourselves in that same way because we have this assurance that no matter what's going on, if I put my best effort through, and even if I don't put my best effort in, uh, the Holy Spirit is still going to use that. Yeah. Um, I kind of think it's cool that it's the Holy Spirit. That's mm -hmm. a comfort to the fact that it's the Spirit teaching. There's not necessarily this raw gospel aspect to our talents, but right or wrong, it's just, you know, doing the best we can and just doing that and loving and having joy in what we do when we do it well. Yeah, the Holy Spirit is sometimes kind of called the, the, the hidden member of the Trinity because he doesn't come right mm -hmm. out and speak to us in, well, he does speak to us through God's word, uh, but we don't see him as clearly as we see like God the Son and God the Father, but that's, that's, that's a good reminder to, to know and have that confidence that, you know, sometimes when I'm using my gifts and my abilities, it isn't a matter of right and wrong or best or worst, it's just having that trust and confidence that no matter how I'm using those gifts and abilities, the Holy Spirit is working through that. So yeah, that's a good point as well. Did I see another hand? No, I think, oh yeah. I, I like to think of the Holy Spirit as um, the one who gives us our faith and the one who leads us to believe. Mm -hmm. So he strengthens us to do those things. Yep, yep. And the Holy Spirit is working through God's word to help strengthen that faith, just kind of like we're doing right now, right? Um, the Holy Spirit is working through us. That's kind of what I talked about, about the hidden member of the Trinity. You might not have even thought about the fact that the Holy Spirit is working right now, uh, but he is as we sit here and study God's word and what it has to say for our lives. So kind of a cool thing. Maybe just one other one, which is going to tie in with our next question. Um, and this is, I think I kind of mentioned, maybe I didn't, but this is a little bit of a case study uh, of what this looks like in the real world. And one of the things that I think is important is especially here in this passage. In the next selection, we're going to talk about the different kinds of gifts and abilities. Um, but Paul here is very much reinforcing the point that we as believers are on the same team, right? Um, you think about what it's like to work out in the world. Um, there's always kind of that com competitive aspect, right? Um, you can't get a good job unless you're competing with other people um, who are also trying to get that job. You're al always kind of trying to justify yourself in the eyes of the world and tell the world, hey, I deserve to be a person. I deserve to be paid. I deserve to be here and exist. Um, and that kind of creates division among people, right? Because ultimately, you have to care about yourself or your family more than you care about other people. Here, Paul is reminding um, his audience that even though it is, there are different gifts and abilities, it's the same spirit. Even though there's different kinds of service that we all have, it's the same Lord. And even though there's different works that people do, it's the same God that's working through them. Um, and this is going to kind of tie in a little bit too in a, in a couple minutes here. That this really helps us kind of get over that jealousy, I think, is very common among Christians. And that envy when we see somebody that's really good at something or really good at has a gift or ability that we maybe would really like to have ourselves, um, we can remind ourselves that, you know, I'm not competing with my fellow believers. I'm not competing with other people that are Christians in using and showing these gifts. We're all on the same team. We're all trying to build up God's church and build up that body of believers. Uh, so I just, I, I feel like this really helps in understanding this really helps to kind of cut through that, those sins of jealousy and envy. All right, Paul goes on to um, say a little bit more. And what I kind of want you to think about, I'm going to jump ahead a little bit. Our second question is, what do you notice about the different gifts that Paul talks about in these verses? So as I read through these couple of verses, just think about that. Think about the gifts and the abilities that Paul is talking about. Um, and what do you maybe notice or what stands out to you versus what you might think of as gifts and abilities that Paul should be talking about? Because I think it's kind of interesting now to each one the manifestation of the Spirit is given for the common good. To one there is given through the Spirit a message of wisdom. To another a message of knowledge by means of the same Spirit. To another faith by the same Spirit. To another gifts of healing by that one Spirit. To another miraculous powers. To another prophecy. To another distinguishing between Spirits. To another speaking in different kinds of tongues. And to still another the interpretation of tongues. 
All these are the works of one and the same Spirit, and he distributes them to each one just as he determines. So take a couple seconds, talk among yourselves, and just notice things. Talk about what you notice about these different gifts that Paul talks about in these verses. And if you, I'll, go, I'll flip back to the passage, but feel free to take your phone out and look up the passage uh, online or on the internet or in a, a physical Bible if you'd like to review it a little bit. gifts and abilities uh, that Paul wrote to the church in Corinth. explicit about the fact that, hey, you guys don't all have the same set of gifts. Um, sometimes we like to think of ourselves as wanting to be the best at every single thing, but Paul here is giving us a pretty good reminder that, you know, you're a unique individual. You have a set of gifts and abilities that God has created you with. You don't have to be upset or mad or jealous because somebody else has other gifts. Just take, um, have appreciation for the gifts that God has given you. So, yeah, I think that's very important. I have to say this, and uh because my wife's a quilter, and I'm surprised she didn't uh, say this, but it's like uh, the, the spirit is the quilt maker, and he's got all these different palettes of things all quilted into one big family, one big piece, kind of the tapestry you said before. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of what the spirit does. He weaves all this together so we become and, you know, uh, good. Yeah, I like that image of weaving, I think, is a very good one. Um, just the idea that we're all attached to one another. Um, yeah. Yeah. You were kind of discussing um, how a lot of these gifts independently um, are, are not as great as they are together. So even this idea of you know someone speaking in tongues and then someone else being able to translate that. So it's like people coming together to work for God instead of just independently, maybe not knowing what that means. You know, mm -hmm. speaking in tongues or can translate it. Yeah, that's a good point, and it kind of anticipates where Paul goes with this. Um, I don't, I'm not, I didn't have the passage prepared for this, but a little later on in 1 Corinthians, Paul kind of talks about what the point of all these things is and, 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 and what the importance is, and he, it's where he, maybe the passage sounds familiar, it kind of sometimes com, comes up at, at uh, weddings, but faith, hope, and love, but the greatest of these things is love, and that kind of ties into where you were going, I think, is the fact that we're all working independently, but we're not kind of isolated from one another. We're all, we're, all, we're all working in love to build up the church. So, yeah, I think that, that's a very good point. Something that you said earlier about, like, um, getting glory from your talents works and by the same spirit, by the same spirit. The glory goes to the spirit, to God. You know, like, all of these talents, everything we do with them goes to God, not to us. So you could look at one that's doing miraculous signs is really kind of cool. Yeah, yeah, that's 
a very good point is who's ultimately getting the glory in all of these things. And Paul is bringing that out here as well, as it's so easy for us as sinful humans to make the glory be all about us. Um, I'm really good at this one thing, or that person's really good, and we think about the person behind the gifts, but we don't always think about the God or the spirit behind those gifts. And so when we see somebody that's really good at something, we can be happy and we can give praise to God that God is being praised through what he's made and created in this person. So that, that's a very good point as well, is that glory is shared with the spirit. Yeah. You may not always see the fruit of that gift. You know, you might, well, what, what you do today might uh, finally give fruitfulness after you pass away, after, you know, uh, it's all for the work of God's kingdom. Yeah, yeah. Um, so that's, that's my point, yeah. Is that instead of glory here, you, you may work at, uh, be it ever so small, uh, that you have the gift of um, fellowship, that, that you can create it, and, and or a fellowship with the particular nice guy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you can talk your way through things and uh, develop a, a spirit of fellowship. And I think that's something that's really, really easy to lose focus on, um, is just the, the long-term uh, goal and long-term perseverance of being a Christian. Because we like to have kind of that instant gratification. I mean, that's, that's just such a thing today where I can hop on Facebook or Twitter and I get that instant dopamine rush from a notification or something like that. Um, but a lot of the times what God cares about is that long-term building of the church. And so we're doing these things, we're using our gifts and we're using our talents and we're using our abilities. And it might be 30 or 40 years before we even see what came of those, if we even see what came of those. Um, a really interesting case study on this, maybe you know uh, the Wisconsin Synod has a mission down in Arizona uh, in the Apache land. I recently learned that they spent, I think it was almost 10 years doing work down there, and in 10 years they had like a couple of baptisms. Um, a, very, a whole decade of work and essentially single digits um, in terms of people that they actually were able to see that they reached, but now over 100 years later, it's like, I think it's one of the largest technical world missions that the Wisconsin Synod has, so it's, it's interesting that you bring that up because that happens so often um, where somebody puts in time and work and effort and doesn't see anything come from it. But then decades or maybe even a century or two later, um, you see how much that expands and explodes. Um, you think about the original apostles where it's just these 12 guys carrying this message of salvation. You see how that spread across the entire world. Um, they probably never even realized or foresaw. They didn't even know North America was a place. Um, and here we are in 2020 and Christianity is here in America. So I think that, that's, that's a good thing too to keep in mind is you know, sometimes we don't see what's happening, and that kind of ties into that trust aspect, is we're always just trusting the Spirit to be working through our gifts and abilities. It's also a good connection, because Paul talks about that in the very beginning of Corinthians, because uh, the Corinthian church was struggling with that as well. Um, kind of who gets the credit for this body. Um, maybe you've read 1 Corinthians and you remember that, but it's another theme that Paul does talk about earlier in the book. So this, kind of, this stuff all kind of connects to it. So. Any other thoughts? One that I had that kind of stood out to me was just how different these gifts are from what I would think of. Um, and I think I kind of picked up on that even from our conversation. Is we, we have a very, I mentioned this earlier, but we, when I think of gifts and talents, I think of music, musicianship, drawing ability, uh, maybe charisma and public speaking and things like that. But some of the gifts Paul talks about are things that I never even would have thrown into the category of gifts. Um, he talks about having a message of wisdom, having knowledge. Um, faith, I think, is really interesting that he talks about as being a gift because it kind of feeds into what we're doing right here, right now, right? Um, we, came, we come to church, we came to study God's word because we have faith. We don't always think of faith as being a gift or a talent that we use, but we're expressing it and using it right now, right? When we come together and study God's word. Um, so if nothing else, you can go home today knowing that you do have talent, you do have a gift, you have that gift of faith that the Holy Spirit, and you used it and exercised it today, everybody in their own different special way. One thing I'd like to add is I think God is just as pleased by a pastor giving a sermon as he is someone maybe at home praying. And, you know, that's the gift of faith. Also. Yep. There's a, I didn't bring it into the slideshow, but there's a very interesting... Uh, forget what the name of it is, but Martin Luther talks about this. Uh, he sometimes calls it the doctrine of vocation, um, that whatever you're doing in life, whatever role or relationship you have, that is an expression of this gift and talent of ability. Um, if you're a dad who's 
having an evening prayer with his children or sitting down after dinner to have a devotion with them. If you're a mom who's faithfully taking her kids to school and faithfully teaching them God's word, um, that's just as much of a, of a good thing in God's eyes as the pastor getting up in front of everybody or the guy playing organ or something like that. So that's a very good point is that this is, we, we, we tend to focus on the people that get a lot of eye space, but we don't think of all the quiet, uh, subtle ways that this happens in our, in our world and in our lives that we don't even see as well. So to close things out, um, I have one more little discussion time for us. God has given you a new, unique set of talents. Um, describe and discuss among yourselves how that affects your attitudes and your actions toward the world around us. So this will kind of be a way to summarize everything we've talked about so far. So just take a minute or two and talk about this and describe that to each other. our discussion on talents and gifts and abilities affect how you view and interact with the world that you see around you. Yeah. I think it keeps us positive and that um, radiates and affects other people around that they look at, you know, things that you've gone through in your life that set back or whatever and you're able to stay positive there because you know that Yeah, that's a very good point. Is this? I think it just helps us keep a positive attitude. Um, it's so easy when you're going to work and maybe you have a bad day at work or your boss got mad at you or your kids got mad at you or your wife or husband is mad at you or something like that. This is something we can look at and reflect on or even if we don't see the good that's coming from our lives, um, we can have that positive attitude and that is something that other people can see as well. I see a question back there? Um, Chelsea, basically all of that says it helps your motivation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Motivation, I think, is very much a big part of this. That's very good. Yeah. I think we go through life on, and we have different platforms at different times, but even in one day, our platform might be work, but then it might be our social with our friends or attending church. So we have different platforms, and God teaches us wisdom in each one of those, and then taking that wisdom and sharing it from platforms. Mm -hmm. like giving what God gives us in each experience and using it for the future. Yeah, that's a very good point. Is this isn't like a compartmentalized thing where when I go to church, that's when my gifts and my talents are on display. Uh, Martin Luther kind of talks about this too, is we have different roles, we have different relationships. I'm a husband, a wife, a mother, a father, a son, and a daughter, an employer, an employee, and all of these different places and all these different roles and relationships or platforms like you put it. Uh, that's a, a place and an opportunity for us to put those gifts and those talents to work. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that's one of the ones that I had written down here too, is I think just kind of piece about your own gifts and talents and abilities. Um, I'm probably never gonna make millions and millions of dollars uh, playing guitar or something like that in front of people or painting a picture or getting something into an art exhibit. Um, but God doesn't care about that kind of stuff. God doesn't care about how much money I make. God doesn't care about how the world measures me up and how the world views me. God cares about me because of what his son Jesus has done for me. And so that's, that, that's the confidence that I can have is that it doesn't matter even if I'm not making a lot of money, even if I'm not the best and the brightest or at, at the very, very top of the pack or leading the pack, um, I still have that quiet, peaceful confidence that God is working. All right, that's kind of all I wanted to talk about so far. Um, let's all bow our heads and we'll kind of end things with a prayer before our final song. Dear Heavenly Father, you created me and every single believer in your kingdom with a unique set of gifts and talents and abilities. You created my physical body and you also created a spiritual person inside of me through what your son Jesus did for me on the cross through his death and resurrection, and through the forgiveness of sins. Please be with us as we take those talents into the various roles and relationships that you give us. Please work through us to work in your kingdom and to build up the body of believers. In your name we pray, amen. amen. And we will close things out with our final hymn, Brothers, Sisters, Let Us Glad. Sisters, let us gladly give to God our all our best. Service hearty, thorough, honest, with a living love impressed. All our duty, all our striving, all our time to Uh, to give you. Uh, so God's blessings on the rest of your day and on the rest of your week. And I pray and 
hope that God finds a way for you to use your talents and your gifts and abilities as he sees fit. Thanks. Thank you. Actually, pushing up there today.